Bernie, thank you so much. Um, this wouldn't be happening without you, so it's really nice for you to have us. We're very excited about it. And as you can see, this technical drama that's happening here on stage, um, this is usually part of our act. Uh, it, it's, we are never without this kind of drama. So it's good we have a stage for it um, here today. Um, Woohoo! And uh, yeah, I, I, so I would like to start the talk if, um, are we pretty much, um, Um, okay, so can you check it quietly, and I'll start. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start until I hear it. How about that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, we all have our roles in this. Um, okay, so this talk um, is called Your Level Building Tool is our sound stage. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, yeah, you know, I really can't start without the screen. Okay, essentially, this talk is about the artistic processes of foci and loci, which is my game art duo with my partner here, Chris Burke. And um, we are an experimental collaboration. Um, we improvise, we build sound machines actually with game engines to improvise during musical performances. And um, a such as now, <laughs> and um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our pieces, um, you know, generally involve using uh, tools that you know we don't really know much about, you know, that are unexplored, undefined as artistic media, um, which is part of what keeps us working as um, artists. I say um, it's oftentimes a um, an interesting thing, artistic identity. In essence, one could call it creative or fluid. So we use PlayStations, and we use um, currently use a game called Little Big Planet. We've done experiments with Minecraft and Portal. Um, I have shows, um, video clips actually, to show you um, if we get there. And um, one of the things, we used some of their cheats and some mods in those games, um, which are really interesting and fun in a spontaneous manner, but um, one of the things that we found difficult to sidestep while using them, of course, is the fact that they're, they have a very branded look to them, um, which is why we like Little Big Planet. Um, it's very easy to um, sidestep the Sackboy avatar, which is, uh, you know, um, the avatar that was made by Media Molecule to let the player play the video game narrative. But uh, when we use the game, we use it for its create mode, which is where the level building tools are. Um, and it's easy to actually put the sack boy into what's called a controlinator, which you have no idea what I'm talking about because uh, we need to get in there and show it to you. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Bring it up, Will. Okay. Next time we do this, we'll just have this be the intro, okay? With all the gear on the table. Okay. Um, I'll just do it briefly. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, Jeremy, maybe I should just sit there since the machine is there. Dead. Wait, no, no, they're not. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I already introduced the talk. Okay, so this is Foci and Loci. This is Chris and myself uh, performing at the Brick Theater in 2011 at a um, festival called Gameplay Festival, which was about artists, uh, presented artists who use um, video games and game engines in live performance. Um, and now I'm going to show you a, a little bit of a clip of our work. Thank you. 
So, for example, in Unity's um, Unity game engine, um, the low polygonal resolution generally will shackle an indie game developer to the computing power of what they can afford. This is pretty clearly stated, I think. So that's sort of one of the reasons things, a lot of times, especially with artists using Unity for sort of sound and audiovisual works, things tend to look um, a lot the same. Um, or the Unreal Engine, which compromises the look of, uh, sorry, comprises the look of many Valve games, um, and which at its best has this no clip cheat mode in Portal 2 that lets you actually fly right out of the map, um, which is really cool and as interesting as the spatial abstraction can be uh, to play with, it still reflects some of um, the iconic industrial look of the test chambers of the game and not to mention the indelible crosshair in the center. And then of course, Minecraft's iconic Lego aesthetic for 3D blocks, and the redstone circuitry, also wonderfully fun for spontaneous creation, um, but yielded nothing that we really felt like we could call our own, because the look is so identifiably clear it was at the time, and is so much more now, especially since um, it's branded further to corporate territory. Okay. So what we really like about Little Big Planet is that it allows us the flexibility, like I was saying, in the way our work looks because of the create mode or the game level building mode. So we're able to redirect or remap our controls um, from the game buttons um, on the game controllers away from the sack boy. Um, by using this thing called a controllinator, which is basically an emulation of the PS3 controller. That's our little sack boy there that you see. Um, and in the slide, he's hidden on the bottom there um, behind that purple uh, microchip board there. Um, okay, so having given you a little background into the processes of Hokai and Lokai, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our panelists and then um, Jeremy will take over. So Chris Burke on the far left over there, um, whom I already mentioned is my partner in Foci and Loci and has been an active game artist for 15 years, and is known for his pioneering uh, contributions in chip music and his award-winning uh, Machinima series, The Spartan Life. Um, Jeremy, um, we're excited to be joined by Jeremy Pesner today, who's a multidisciplinary technologist. Um, he's also the assistant director of the Music and Gaming Education Sympo Symposium as part of MAGFest, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, I believe there are some MAG folks here at the conference this weekend. Um, he's spoken about and demonstrated extensively on how to evaluate player experience in video games. And then this is me performing um, I'm a, I'm, my name's Tamara Yadao. I'm a multimedia artist, performer, and educator. Um, and I essentially am an experimentalist. I like to experiment with conceptual methods of sound making or music making, and that includes repurposing um, 
antiquated forms of technology, gaming hardware, radios, transmitters, etc. cetera. Um, okay. So um, without further ado, Jeremy, would you like to give context for our work? Certainly. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Whoops. Jumped the gun a bit there. So uh, my name is Jeremy Pesner, and I'll be talking about the brief cultural evolution of, of video game fandom. Uh, Chris, when Chris and Tamara first put this panel together, they invited me to talk for some reason. So uh, what you might see and what I'm about to talk to is a little bit different than what you might be used to. So I'm just going to get right to it. Um, at this point, gaming is very deep in our culture. It's not hard to find music covers and fan videos, cosplayers, fan fiction, but don't read the fan fiction, seriously. Uh, but KS. Why, why do video games inspire this type of work, and why this type of work? That was the question I ultimately set out to answer for my section of this presentation. And I won't make this too heady or academic, but when I started searching, I was actually surprised by how quickly I found one. Google Scholar, folks, sometimes it can really be helpful and you really have to go nerdy sometimes to get the answer to this. Basically, TLDR, fandom is a way to lend cultural and institutional validity to media that would likely not be otherwise supported. And I'm gonna explain what media that might just be right now. We don't really see much fandom around classical musicians or painters or playwrights. I mean, they exist, certainly, but not in comparison to the types of gaming fandom and Star Trek fandom that we would know of. Uh, the fan works and celebrations of popular media, like games, is our way as a community of keeping them alive in the public consciousness and pushing them forward. John Fisk, from the, uh, who's, author, who's the author of the article that I've been citing, he identifies fandom as being a mechanism for validity in what we call low culture, even if the definition between low and high culture is ambiguous at best. So it's pretty clear which, which uh, game, the way the games were painted when they first came out. It's pretty clear what category they were put into. But that even predates video games, I'd say. I think games as a whole have generally been treated as lower culture. Monopoly is the only exception I can think of, at least off the top of my head, especially because they come out with a new edition of something every half year. But that perception of gaming has been changing. In not too long a time span, gaming has gone from a fringe hobby to something that's appreciated by every part of society, including the people who have social and economic capital. The more social and economic capital people have, the more they're likely to elevate uh, artworks and other things of their taste to uh, what you might call higher culture. Additionally, we as fans have created our own institutions and communities to support gaming, and I'm going to explain more on that in a moment. So what's interesting recently is that even though most fandom has been expressed in unofficial culture, as we've seen, there are an increasing number of examples where it's being uh, expressed in high culture, in official culture. I mean, the Gamer Symphony Orchestra has been touring for years, and Braid set a, standard, a new standard in the video games as art question. So gaming is definitely crossing that line that is you know, as permeable as it was to start with. I sort of think of it like a reverse Andy Warhol, though, because most gamers don't actually have too much official culture in their background and upbringing. That's not the sort of thing that necessarily they have the, um, they've been sort of raised and, and, and have the context to fully appreciate. So uh, uh, Andy Warhol is the person who is known for making popular art into official or high culture, the guy who created four, you know, uh, color palette swaps of a Campbell soup can. So. But we, what is happening here, though, is instead of sort of bringing gaming up to an official culture level, people in fandom are taking gaming elements of official culture and bringing it point to a place where gamers can already appreciate it. Um, where it will, that's where they can still attract the uh, audience and attention of gamers, but still sort of being a bit different from what we might be used to. And that's really a sort of role that MAGFest plays. Uh, it's awesome, and you really all should come, just putting it out there. Now, next year will be my 10th MAGFest, and it's different from any other con out there. We're one of those institutions that official culture normally has to support it. We, are, we don't take corporate sponsorship, and we're by fans for fans. As Tamara mentioned, I helped to direct the Music and Gaming Education Symposium. We provide a quasi-academic space to discuss the theory and structure of games in details, but the structure, those conversations are meant for anyone, and you don't need a degree to participate. So we sort of serve as one of those um, uh, 
cultural institutions of gaming that uh, you know a symphony orchestra or you know a, a high-end playhouse might have for those media. So coming back to uh, this question of foci and loci, you know, what is this thing that they do? Well. I would call it abstract video art, ab abstract video expressionism, but programmed and controlled from inside Little Big Planet's level design environment. It's a unique and semi-interactive world. And when I first saw them doing this work, I knew that they were going to have to participate in mages. And I had to, you know, I had to persuade them for a little while because they weren't necessarily sure it was the right venue. We, but we didn't have any funny hats to wear. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's all changed now. <laughs> Fortunately, it was the right venue, and, and they found, they've really found a nice home in mages. And I think we're, as we sort of, as we go forward, I'm going to be interested to discuss with them the sort of permeability between what is considered low and high culture and the audience for each. So I've talked enough, though. It's time to let them do their thing. Thank you. Are we, um, okay. I, I, I think at this point, um, I was going to show you a, some footage from a video, but I think we'll just go right into the PlayStation. And if we have time later, we can do that. So. Um, I don't know whether you want to sit out there. Can you see it well enough? Can I see it? Yeah, um, I'll, um, I'll move if, if yeah. I need to. Okay. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know how it works. <laughs> so if you do, okay. I'm going to have to bring a microphone. Okay, so do you know where it's right there? Okay, yeah, great. Right in the middle. Okay, so I'm going to show you this map um, that I did with um, using pods in a particle uh, synthesis demonstration, which involves um, grains of microsound in which three pods with multiple particle objects have been programmed to interact with each other. Um, and through these interactions, we, th we see three aspects of um, behavior, what I call behavioral glitch. So um, <clears throat> this is sort of my you know, example of how using the tools in a way that they weren't intended for. And if you'll see progressively over the, the course of looking at the three pods that they, they do different things. Um, OK. So um, let me just pan out here so you can see this is the control innator that we were talking about. Chris is going to demonstrate this actually um, after me in his game map. Um, but this is sort of, you know, these are microchips that um, you can endow with the behaviors. For, and I have one for each pod. So that's one, that's one, and that's one right there. But I'm going to put it um, in preview mode. So it takes all of that stuff away and we can look at it. And if we have time, we'll go back and look at it a little more closely. So I'll show them to you first and then I'll talk about each one. So I'm going to jump out here. Oh, yeah. thanks. Can you see from the podium? No. Yeah, really. yeah. She's coming out into the audience. Ooh. We, we do this too sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, um, Gus. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me just put it in a preview on pause. And it's loud. Thanks. Okay. I'll just ride this. All right.
just three little demonstrations. Thank you. Um, I'll just return quickly. Yes. A cigarette. Can I get a smoke out here? I have to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, um, wait, were you asking me for a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to smoke because that was awesome. Oh, yes, yes, and thank you. Um, I, uh, <laughs> so basically those were just sort of these three pods um, I made that, that sort of play with this idea of overloading the system um, through algorithmic means, um, where the objects, you know, they interact with each other and as they touch each other, they begin to um, behave differently. Um, the physical, they can activate physical changes in the, the material, um, the characteristics of their material and um, adding the water was just sort of like adding another complex element you know to to an already chaotic system so um, you know the first one is just sort of like an example of like some of the glitching the sound obviously clicking is really um, <clears throat> indicative of overloading a system as a lot of um, electronic musicians know when they when they overload their CPUs um, and then the second pod was more about how the valencies work or the attractions between these objects work. Um, and some of them, I have to tell you, some of, some of that programming I really did not intend for. They just sometimes, some, if you saw three or four of them just kind of bonding and like, you know, kind of like shaking out of control, that's sort of um, an emergent uh, behavior, I think, that came out of just, you know, putting those specific, um, behaviors onto the microchips. I think the force chip, which propelled the motion, you know, every time I hit the X button, you know, the, the particles would sort of like bounce around in the air from just a propulsion that was created by a chip um, on their programming. Um, and then the fourth one was just really straightforward, just full overload, see what I could do. And, um, you know, it's, it is kind of subtle, but, um, you know, the, the glitching out is really, I mean, the frame rate was really dropping a lot. Um, you know, it was kind of cool to see all of those little objects too, after, like really satisfying for me at the end of it all. Um, but that, you know, is essentially just the basis. Um, it's just a very basic example, I think, that's pretty straightforward when it comes to this idea of like kind of trying to do glitchy things or messing around with the environment or pushing the tools. Um, so I think, Chris, I think it's time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Would you, before we switch back, could you, uh, actually I'll do it. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna load my map so we don't have to wait later. Um, okay. 
I could show um, the flotrillium while you're doing that. Video? Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, well, let, yeah, let me just get it loaded. I mean, let it get it start loading. Okay. Um, are there any other questions at the moment since we're, we sort of need these little gaps? Yes, yes. Are you familiar with Blab? No. Blab.im? Mm -mm. So anybody here know Blab? Blab I'm not, I don't work with an investor. I just use the tool. If you, if you're, it's like you know, you're on YouTube, but live streaming. And then if you hit props, little hands, it shows a little icon, a little circle, right? The other day I was doing it. I think it'd be funny if they could be bouncing around just like that and hitting each other, and then you could create almost like marbles hitting each other in almost like an ionic level of chaos. Oh, cool. Well, I, I will definitely have to check that out. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. You said blab.im? Blab. I, I, Sorry to interrupt. Yes, no, not, not at all. <laughs> okay, thanks. So we're going to play this um, now? How do you feel like uh, the constraints influence your creative process, uh, like relative to using another tool? Like I know some people use Max MSP for somewhat similar things. Yes, um, very. We like constraints a lot, and in fact, it's interesting that you that you mentioned Max MSP. Um, I know some users would probably argue with this, but. Um, I kind of feel like it is sort of like Max MSP, you know, for video games in a way. I mean, it's that's what we like to call it. Except that it's, it's almost entirely proprietary. Right. <laughs> that's a pretty big except. Yes. But it it is was developed so deeply that you know you can really put things together, and I think even in Max MSP, if you stuck to really simple objects, you could still create some pretty interesting emergent behaviors. Um, because it gets out of control at some point. And uh, the nice thing about being an artist when you're trying to program this stuff is that you know, you, you know just enough to get the job done and then you let the machine take over. You know? Right. <laughs> it does, for context, it does things that you never expected. For context, Max MSP is a piece of software that can deconstruct elements of audio and video and you can link them up in very interesting ways. Oh, right, right. thank to, you. Uh, play this? Yeah, do you want to show? Sure. Just show. Um, so this this does actually have the sad boy in it, um, even though we don't really use um, the sack boy or girl. Actually, they're sad girls too. And this was just a very straightforward experiment with sound objects. Time lapsed it at the end there. You gotta have the explosion. Yeah. Can I sit there, Jim? Yeah. Can we switch? So now what? What's happening? <clears throat>
So there's obviously a bit of overlap, um, actually probably amongst all three of us. Um, Tamara and I work together, so we, we have a lot of the same interests. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, since it's a hackers conference, um, talk a little bit about hacking game engines uh, very briefly. And just, I don't wanna do like a history here. I've done it before. Um, it's not that interesting to me anymore, but I mean, just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, for uh, in to create context for what we do now, um, so I kind of I wor started working in Machinima. Uh, I don't know in 2005, uh, which was pretty late. The Machinima. So oh, yeah, define Machinima. So Machinima is the real time uh, the use of real time computer graphics engines or video game engines to create a cinematic production. Uh, it can be narrative or it can be more experimental, like video art. Um, there's been a lot of different types, but basically the big thing that differentiated it from like speed runs and various other type, types of recorded game material or let's play videos now, you see a lot of those on YouTube, is the narrative aspect. Um, so uh, in 1996, there was a uh, video called Diary of a Camper uh, made by a, a Quake gaming clan, the Rangers. Some of you might know about that if you have ever looked up Machinima. Um, and it was the first time that basically Quake, uh, id software built into the game Quake uh, a feature that allowed you to save the data from your game, from your deathmatch, essentially, right? And you could then share those, the data. It wasn't a video file, it was just data. And if you loaded it into your game engine, your Quake game, it would play back the same match that that person had. So essentially it was like video, um, and there's a whole, um, conceptual aspect to the difference between those two things that I, obviously this is not the day to do that but I think it's super interesting um, that you have you know video is very linear and data you know it still is basically playing back in a linear faction, fashion but it's recreating the entire thing on the fly as opposed to having it frozen in, in media in that in the usual sense um, so just the possible, the, the fact that, that uh, it put that feature in the game was very forward thinking. They realized at that time in 1996, it's a long time ago, right? It's 30 years ago? Is that right? 20, 20 years, my math is really good. This is why I'm not a programmer. Um, so they realized even back then that, uh, that this was something that, that gamers were gonna like. They're gonna wanna be able to record their games and do things with them and it basically extended the shelf life of the game because you know, people would be interested in it for longer if you know, they could do more stuff with it besides play it. Um, uh, so that basically gave birth to Machinima, what we now know as Machinima um, and uh, that's had a weird past um, but, but essentially it's interesting that it started not necessarily from a hack. I mean, there was a hack in the sense that they were thinking about a game differently when they made that video. Um, I, I could show you a little piece of it. Uh, let me just do that real quick. Um, it's, not, it's not very interesting by today's standards. It's interesting mostly in that it's really, really low poly. Uh, so you don't see that much anymore. Um, so I guess I just have to drag it over there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So you probably can't even see that. It's so, it's so low poly, you couldn't even get enough light pixels to <laughs> actually describe objects very well. Um, but this is, this is what Quake looked like. It was very, uh, you know, early game, early uh, 3D game. Um, so uh, it's kind of beautiful in its own way. Uh, you, you would not know that there was a story here unless you watched the whole thing. But let me, you know, just take it from me. There's a story there. Um, so... Uh, so I think what's interesting there is that it, they're, they, they're adding the story element to it was a sort of a hack. It was a hack in the way they were thinking about video games, uh, the concept of, it hacked the concept of video games, if you will. But it was also enabled by id Software building that feature into the game. So right from the birth of Machinima, there was this dual force that came, that propelled it forward. One was the users wanting to hack it and do more with it, and the other was the companies trying to keep up with what they were doing uh, within the, um, realm that would not upset their lawyers. So that's the other thing, which I've gone into in detail in the past, but we'll kind of skim over that for this, the sake of this talk. Um, so jumping forward uh, almost like nine years, uh, in 2005 I started a, a video series on the internet called The Spartan Life, uh, and it began with a hack. Uh, in Halo 2, the only way to get a camera mode, you couldn't like film, you know, you couldn't really film, you could film the game if you got the output of the video, but you would always have a gun in, in your way, right? So somebody figured out if you pick up a skull 
in this one game called Oddball, and you press this button and you fire your gun at the same time, you drop the skull and the gun, and you have a completely clear view, which essentially is a camera, right? So we would get two people in the game, have them do that. So every time at the beginning of we, our shoot, we'd have to go through this ritual of you know get the Oddball. So it'd have to be in this particular game type called Oddball. We drop the skull, drop the gun, then we had our two cameras. We taped the output of those two Xboxes, and on the third one, I would be moving around as the host of the show. We'd invite people in on Xbox Live and they would be the guests. So the two camera people would constantly be following us around and videotaping us, essentially. Um, so it started with a hack, and then in Halo 3, uh, Bungie just threw in theater mode, because they could. Uh, and theater mode was sort of like an update of what id Software did with Quake, where you could um, basically record the game data. So every bullet that's fired, every person that runs this way, that way, the look of their, uh, their avatar, everything is remembered in data. And then you can play it back, uh, what, what, what they call film clips, which is a really weird title for something that's absolutely digital. <laughs> they just decided to call it film clips because, hey, let's go old school, you know? Um, and, uh, and then you could stop it, start it. So let me just, I have a theater mode clip here. I was gonna show you, so am I done? Okay, cool. So I'm just going to show you this. I'm going to move on. So this is uh, Halo 3. So you'll see the, the camera's attached to the avatar there, but look, it just detached. And now it's flying three. So what this is, is you're seeing a replayed video game. You're just watching the data recreate the game on the fly in the game engine. And you can attach to your avatar, and then see he detached again, where he's flying out a little further away. Watch him kind of swing out to the right up here. So in this way, you could let the game play back. Uh, you could let the game play back. The, the, so you could basically create your, in our, in our case, we did an interview, right? We didn't actually play the game the way you're supposed to. We just did an interview in the game. We'd shoot each other and blow things up and all that because it's fun. But we then replay that game and connect the output to, um, a, you know, digitizer. Well, essentially a, a capture box, right? And we capture the video one shot at a time. So we get a long shot of each scene. Then we move in for close-ups, just the way you do in a film, right? Uh, the nice thing about it is that all the acting and, and, and blocking has already been done. So the camera person doesn't have to, you know, worry about, well, I got the shot right, but the actor messed it up. You know, you've already got, you already know where your good takes for the acting or the moving around are, and all you have to do is worry about the camera. Um, so basically, so essentially the same thing happened there, right, is it started with a glitch and it became a feature. Um, and that's kind of the dual nature of machinima and a lot of, of game hacking is that, you know, People want to push the, these systems further because they can, right? These the really complex systems. Uh, and the game companies want to help them do it because it extends the shelf life of the game, but they all want to, also want to be careful about the legalities involved. Bullshit, I call, but you know, that's the way they are. So, um, so I'm gonna jump forward now. Uh, basically, I'm just gonna try to trim some of this. Um, so in, what was it, 2010, Little Big Planet one? No. Something like that. Um, 2008, I think. 2008, wow. So the first Little Big Planet was maybe 2008, somewhere thereabouts. For some reason, I didn't bother to look that up. Um, five minutes? Eight. Eight minutes. Um, okay, so I'm going to just jump in real quick into Little Big Planet. I'm going to show you kind of how it's, I mean, you've already seen a little bit of what Tamara showed you, um, and it's kind of come pretty far since then. Yeah. yeah. Keep your finger on this. Oops. Fail to load map. We were so close. So this might take a few minutes to load. It's a very, very big map. So one of the things, uh, first I should tell you what this is, you're gonna see. Um, so Tamara and I have been doing these kind of uh, conceptual art pieces in, in, in Little Big Planet for a while. We really like that. And I kind of, before that I had done the Spartan Life, which was more of a talk show, it's kind of a more of a narrative. Um, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, and I just keep kind of bouncing between those two extremes and I thought, why don't I try to find a <laughs> good, happy middle ground where it's still pretty, conceptually odd, um, but it's understandable and it's a form that people might get. So for some reason I decided to make a musical. Uh, 
So this is essentially, oh, okay, I gotta go over here. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is essentially, I'm not gonna sing with this, but normally there'd be three singers on the stage, and what you're seeing would be the, the, the backdrop, essentially the scenery, okay? Um, I haven't done this in about four months, so I'm probably gonna mess it up, um, but you probably won't even notice. Okay, so um, everything you see in here is done in the game engine, including the music. The music is created with sequencers in the game engine itself. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can, you know. <laughs> I don't remember what to do. Wow. Hmm. I'm sure there was something I was supposed to do here. I'm probably not in the controlinator. Okay. pause for a second here uh, just to kind of explain what you've seen here so basically uh, there's no singing up until the point where we saw this stage and essentially you're supposed to be inside of the the home of the main protagonist um, and he's singing about these robots that he's created because he's a, a frustrated musician who's trying to create great electronic music but he can't make music as good as the robots and these this is the best <laughs> he can do essentially um, all right so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna add anything else we'll just kind of go through the rest of this
Okay, so I've gone over a little bit, I think, so maybe we'll just, thanks. I don't know how much that you could understand without the lyrics, but hopefully it meant something to you. Um, so I'm just, we'll just go right to, uh, to, to Jeremy now, I guess. Would you I like to come back up here? Yeah. So. <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sure you all have some questions, so please feel free to start lining up in front of the mic. I'm just going to ask one question to kick it off. Um, so Chris, as we've seen here, you've definitely um, been working in this machinima theme for quite a while now, creating different sorts of projects and different engines. Uh, and one thing we didn't even discuss here is, is uh, your long career as a chiptune uh, musician as well. So, um, I'm Why would we want to do that? <laughs> Fair enough. But I am curious to hear, um, in each of these instances, you know, they have, st they have varied wildly in terms of their tone, in terms of how they communicate. What do you sort of envision, who do you envision the audiences for each of these? And how do you think it changes from piece to piece? And to the extent you're even comfortable with this designation, how do you think it sort of fits in this low art slash high, the slow culture, high culture dichotomy? Yeah, really good framing. I think that was that was really good for you to kind of put that framing on on the talk tonight. That was really nice because um, it is it's something that Tamara and I Tamara will talk about this too a little bit. I think um, I certainly can. And uh, uh, it's something that I you know I feel like I am forever at a loss as to what any audience wants. I mean, I I, I kind of. Maybe it's just a personal thing, I don't know. But I, I basically just make what I like and look for a response. Um, I, I try to try to branch out a lot. I've, if anything, maybe I've done too many disparate things. So somebody might like my chip music, uh, but they look at, you know, Robot Apocalypse and then like, the, what the hell is this? That's not <laughs> chip music. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell, but I, I think I started to explain it that, you know, that, that, that I, tr I try to hit that sweet spot between completely insane artwork and, you know, something that an audience might at least understand. I mean, un understanding the work is very important. Um, so Foci and Loci definitely gets, you know, we, we intentionally allow it to be as esoteric as we, we feel it needs to be in each particular map. Um, uh, but this obviously is a little bit more focused. Um, and actually I made it specifically with MAGFest in mind. So yeah. hopefully MAGFest will like well, it. I think, yeah. I think the idea of working with narrative too. Um, I think just having spoken earlier about how we we're interested in sidestepping narratives by, you know, doing away with a Sackboy avatar in Little Big Planet just so we could uh, freely create. Um, you know, so having that narrative, I think, gives access immediately. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, esoteric is, is a big theme <laughs> in both of our artistic lives. Uh, I, there we only a have a few minutes left, so uh, let's turn Sorry. to the audience and do some rapid fire answers. Sorry, folks. I guess, I don't know if this is ready for a rapid fire answer, but uh, I guess my question, uh, the art's amazing, and, and so something important about art is preserving it, right? And keeping it around so people in the future can see it. And we do this really well with sort of, you know, sculptures and museums right now. But I guess I'm curious about how you guys are thinking about preserving this for the future. What, what are the museums of the future gonna look like? How are they gonna display this work? Well, um, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, I, I mean, currently, you know, video art in general is sort of um, an issue when it comes to how, how should it be sold, how should it be displayed um, in museums, archived. Um, I mean, you know, we can't, we can't really sell these works. Um, we haven't tried yet, but, um, you know, they, it's, I mean, it's ex we haven't even spoken. I, I guess we have spoken to Media Molecule maybe about mm -hmm. about trying to get some of our work out there, and they think that what we do is interesting. Media Molecule being the initial developer, but um, I I don't actually really know. We we do perform it mostly. Um, we haven't made DVDs yet, but we were actually thinking about that, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. If I can just jump in really briefly, I you know I think that preserving this in video is is one thing that we definitely do, but it, yeah. as you can see, it's just not the same. I mean, I don't know how, how yeah. much you could see what Tamara and I were doing the controllers, but this is very performative work. It's it's, it, I mean, I messed up a bunch of cues in that last thing. You probably <laughs> that when the toaster was blowing that dude away, <laughs> it was supposed to destroy that last wall. I like didn't hit the the tag sensor in the right angle, and it just didn't destroy the wall. Um, so you know, it really is kind of a very focused performative type of work. So the only way to really preserve it correctly would be to make it, you know, playable on some other platform that exists beyond the PlayStation. Which Do good luck with that. We have time that. for maybe one or two yeah. more questions. So I think you got to one of mine. Uh, you when you showed the three pods in the beginning of your presentation, you're saying those three pods. Combined to create what you what we saw on the screen afterwards, and you were 
controlling it with a some kind of control, or do you have to write code to do this, or what? Oh, um, right. Yes, uh, there were three pods that had that um, behaved differently with three different sets of particle objects. Um, and I was showing sort of the results of playing each pod. Um, and I was playing it with, um, with this game controller. And the controls of these buttons were actually mapped to um, objects in the Little Big Planet level uh, building toolkit, um, which unfortunately we didn't really get to show today. But if you look online and you look up Little Big Planet um, level building tools, It'll show you an array of you know, sensors and various uh, microchips and other behaviors that you can you know, program into um, these objects that you can build with materials. Does that make sense? Yes. Can we uh, get our last question? Uh, shoot, I have, kind of have two, but maybe they can be kind of short. One of which is, how long did that take, Chris? <laughs> and the question. pods look slightly yeah. simple to make. But, um, and the other one is just like, what is your favorite um, weird little feature or affordance or property to play with each of you within uh, Little Big Planet? Uh, uh, really quickly, that took, uh, I don't know, I've been working on that piece. I probably worked on it for about eight months, that particular thing I just showed. Um, obviously not consistently. I work for a living. I don't get paid for this work generally. I get to travel and stuff. But uh, And um, favorite, I mean, th let me draw a dichotomy between that work, which is really kind of you know, 90% perspiration and the foci and loci work, which is more about we think about it and we can conceive of something we think might work in an interesting way. We allow it to break, we allow it to do this other stuff. It's still really hard work, but there's a, a bit more of a reward in a sense of uh, you're surprised by it every time you play it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have a favorite um, thing? I would say the tag sensors, which will transmit signals based on, you know, uh, player proximity or object proximity, um, tags and tag sensors. Yes, yeah, so the uh, programming, we do, we, the question was before, do we program any of this? We kind of soft program it. I don't know what the word would be, but there's no actual number crunching. Um, well, right. you do have to know math a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's basically drag and drop, okay? But they they put in logic gates and things like that, so you can really combine things to, if you get to know the quirks of the behaviors of each of the objects, you can get to build these really complex machines to do things that the game was and never some music to theory, too, actually, yeah, which is interesting. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What um, do you think? Gus, is that satisfactory? <laughs> 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 well, I'd love to, love to see you. I haven't seen you yet, so yeah. let's talk more. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. I think that's our time. Thanks very so much, thank everybody. Everyone. Thank you. And thanks so much to the tech crew for pulling us together yes. like at the last minute there. It was great. Really appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you so much. Maya and Andrew and everybody else and Bernie.